Nothing may ever be the same around here at Skeptico. Okay, don't, you don't need to take your clothes off. This is not I like my of, shoulders being It's short. not that kind of thing, I don't it, think. Everything not is yet, that kind of not thing. Not yet. It could get there. I don't know. I'm a little skeptical. <laughs> yeah, that's that. it. That's Meryl and Bo from the Campfire Shit Show. And you'll hear a lot more about them. You'll come to understand what that show is all about and maybe even why I decided to do kind of a wacky show on conspiracies. I think it came out great. I think these people are extremely talented and are on the edge of where podcasting is really going. They do such a great job, and it was so fun having them here in the studio for a little while to talk with me. really doesn't require a lot of introduction. Let's get right on to the show. Today, I have a special, if you will, episode of Skeptico, special for me at least because Marilyn Bo from the Campfire Shit Show podcast are actually joining me in my little home studio. So, you guys, welcome. Thank Thanks you. so much for being here. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. We are trapped in a dungeon, if anyone's wondering. So. <laughs> if they don't, if you never hear from Marilyn Bo again, <laughs> just leave us here. It's really nice. So, we'll just stay and serve me food like once a week or something. We're fine. Well, thanks. We're really happy to be here. So it's great to have you here. So Meryl, I met you online because I have this wacky idea mm -hmm. of doing this conspiracy show kind of thing. And uh, it's a new project and I ran across you and it just was so fun because you are such a cool person and you're into conspiracies like I am, which was cool. <laughs> and then you introduced me to this awesome podcast that you do with Bo here. And you guys have such a great dynamic and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, you know, this might be fun to talk about both from the conspiratorial angle, which we both are interested in and I'm interested in. And I'm always trying to pull skeptical listeners in because I say this is essentially at what's in, in one way or another. It's the heart of what Skeptico is about because we run into these conspiracies, whether we want to or not. And I've certainly run into them just trying to follow the trail of uh, consciousness science. So with that, mm. I thought I'd turn it over to you guys to do a little bit of introduction. Tell us more about yourself. Tell folks about the Campfire Shit Show. Yeah, yeah. yeah go for it. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll start. Yes, do I'm it. Honest, so I'll start. <laughs> I'm Meryl. I'm one half of Campfire Shit Show. And uh, I worked for 11 years in the music industry. Oh, nice neck out. Oh, there you go. Okay, good. <laughs> That's, that wasn't on screen. See, they're only seeing. Oh, you. yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. And uh, I just say nice neck, Alex. I have like a, a sickness <laughs> where I just compliment people in their body parts. And uh, I would say I got into the kind of conspiratorial realm or, you know, whatever realm uh, a few years ago. I actually had a weird thing that we can talk about, but I was doing a lot of yoga and kind of like healing practices. And I almost want to say that I had some type of like weird soul breakdown. It's really, really weird. But um, we'll skirt over that now and maybe get into it a little bit later. But it kind of <laughs> it opened up. It was like a mix with a, a little bit of like a nervous breakdown mixed with, I would say, like kind of a soul awakening and maybe some type of opening. And once I kind of recovered from uh being able to like function a few months later, I started. We've just about, lost about uh, half of our audience there, Meryl. So <laughs> keep going with whoever is still remaining. No, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. You're pouring your heart out. You're not making jokes. You're supposed to be the comedian anyway, but no, that's, that's all real stuff. Please. No, continue. Okay. Good. Just my grandma at this point. Was listening. And my grandma actually just passed away. So she's not listening, but who knows, according to this podcast, she may be listening from somewhere else. My favorite part of this so far is that he asked like, tell us about the campfire shit show. And you go, well, the reason that I'm a skeptic is... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so long story short <laughs> is uh, I do some comedy writing. I do some copywriting, all that kind of stuff. I'm very involved in the music industry and events, and we have our podcast. But the more exciting part is I'm a huge the seeker of truth and information. So, <laughs> Bo, you're not buying the seeker thing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Right? Meryl is so full of shit right now. I'm just telling you. <laughs> um, no, uh, no. Meryl believes everything that she says. She doesn't make stuff up at all. I just, that's where her and I sort of like, uh, I guess, disagree in many ways. Um, 
you know, how Campfire Shit Show even got started, we worked on a TV show together, sort of writing comedy and short films and things like that. And then that turned into, I realized she was doing a podcast. I wanted to do a podcast. And they were like, well, let's do something together, but what would it be? And I was like, well, let's just talk. Let's talk. And I know that seems very, like, <laughs> boring. Like, oh, what's your show about? Just two people talking. You know, it's like, but uh, honestly, we get together and we have all types of topics. And through those topics, whether it be, uh, you know, honestly, uh, Meryl shitting your pants in a Whole Foods or me getting uh, cheated on and then me catching them in the act and telling that story. This it, all happened last week, by yeah, the way. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a normal week. That's just us. one week, guys. Yeah. Uh, well, but in the process of that, <laughs> so like, she's always like, well, that's, you know, you're doing others lizard people. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? Or... Don't, let's talk about Pizzagate. And I'm like, oh, you're such a mess in so many ways. And so uh, I am very skeptical. And when she told me about this, I'm like, oh, no, I, I got to see these crazy people. I'm let's, like, we're going to this guy's house. I met him on Craigslist. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is danger all around. Let's do it. Um, that's the campfire shit show spirit. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And that, that's what we brought, you know, for, for people we're just joking around. We brought a little bit of the shit show to Skeptico because I am certainly not above shit showing it. I'm, I'm all about that. That's Good. great. You, you know, it, and one of the things I thought was really cool about you guys and uh, what you do and being on the scene in San Diego in terms of the comedy scene, the TV scene, trying to make all that stuff happen, which is crazy as, it, <laughs> as anyone would know but you know one place we might start to kind of jump into this thing which Marilyn and I talked a little bit about is this uh, connection between comedy and conspiracy so you know it, it's uh, so I, I, I had a couple examples I mean you listen to Dave Chappelle on Netflix, right? And he's dropping the conspiracy bombs you know hey man you know what if the sexual thing in Hollywood, what if that's not the whole thing, he says. And what if, you know, the reason I went to go, went away for all those years, nobody really knows. And then uh, uh, Bill Burr, I don't know if you guys know Bill Burr. I mean, Bill Burr is like way out there. I mean, he's just directly talking about the conspiracy stuff. And then, of course, uh, Joe Rogan with the most, who is, I guess, a comedian. I don't really know if he's a comedian anymore. I never thought he was <laughs> Was he ever a comedian? I mean, he's yucking it up with Alex Jones. And yeah. Movie. Although he's turning around and stabbing him in the back afterwards. But who cares? He's still, you know, talking about conspiracy at a, in a very serious way. And then at the same time, poking fun of it. And then you have um, you have conspiracy culture. You know, you look at that and you go, oh, wow, where'd you dig up that? That's some crazy Illuminati picture. Well, look at the bag down over here in the corner. It's Taco Bell. That's a Taco Bell ad. And anyone who's seen those ad, you don't know whether they're totally making fun of the whole conspiracy thing right. or if they're trying to embrace it in some way. So I think there's a lot to talk about, both in terms of conspiracy in comedy, where, you know, they're the truth tellers, are they telling us a different truth? And then conspiracy in culture, I mean, any thoughts, uh, Meryl? Let's start with you. Any thoughts on what's going on there? Okay, so my first thought was a few weeks ago, I had Vo research with me on if Dave Chappelle is even a clone or not. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm, uh, you know, I think he may have went away for a few years, just like Eminem did, and come back a model of himself, like, built by cloning agents. <laughs> Really? Yeah. So the other half of the audience I, that I was like listening. That even yeah, that just Alex is out. looking at you. Yeah, like, Alex what? is like, I'm so sorry, but you're too weird. No, she sent me a whole page of YouTube videos like why Dave Chappelle's a clone. And I was like, this is a thing? God, you can get so deep into the, the dark internet. Just even on YouTube. Because so. he went away and now he looks different. Like I know his cheekbones are kind of different and it looks like him. Same thing as Eminem is their like facial features have changed. So. You know, it's, it's funny that whenever any of these celebrities changes in any way, you know, then we're like, no, give me the old Eminem. I don't care what I have yeah. to substitute to get him. To, you know, me he, too. Some has changed because he ain't shit from what he was before. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think Chappelle is different because the new Chappelle is, is awesome too. But he is so different than the old Dave. I think we want to substitute in that stuff. I, I, to me, all that talk is... 
is another aspect of this conspiracy culture, which, you know, I mean, I don't want to kind of dismiss out of hand the cloning thing, but I'm going to dismiss it out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy. Well, the other side, too, is I am in the music industry as well, and I attend Coachella and a lot of shows. And now when I'm there, I'm noticing, like, a lot of the symbols that I kind of associate with Illuminati. But now it's almost become so mainstream that almost everyone knows that. Like, I've seen a lot on Katy Perry's Instagram. You know, her latest album has the eye. A lot of stuff, a lot of people wear, like, Baphomet uh, jewelry in their videos, and people are commenting now, like, Illuminati or, you know, stuff like that. So that's almost become kind of like mainstream now for people to call it out on people's things. So I don't know if they're, and I'm still discovering my own opinion on this of whether or not they're shoving it down our throats or, and kind of uh, not caring that it's so obvious or they're like making a whole mockery of it in general and uh, they're doing it almost like in a kind of mocking way. Well, that was the whole point of bringing up the Taco Bell ad. You know, I mean, that certainly touches both of those, because if you watch the Taco Bell ads, they're not totally they're not totally suppressing the giggle factor. But by the same token, they're not totally embracing it either. Uh, but but where do you come down on some of that stuff, Bo? Is it just too all too well, crazy? Uh, I mean, I kind of think like uh, my, my, my gut reaction uh, when I'm at see something that's like Meryl bring up an Illuminati or some sort of symbol. And I'm like, why would it be so blatant in the public eye? Why, why even take the chance as she says, like Beyonce makes the triangle or whatever. And it's like, what's the point? So she does it. And if anybody's like, well, what is that? It's like, well, they're not going to immediately be invited into this club. So that's like, why put it out there for people to uh, even question? Why can't it just be, why wouldn't it just be a secret society? Instead of being like, there are all these images and all these places where it's uh, featured and we want to tell you that it's out there. So come on, everybody, join our big group that's secret. It's like, what? Um, as far as the Taco Bell thing, I think that's good branding. I think that's just an idea. That's an ad campaign of good branding. It's like anything else. Like uh, you want to put your brand everywhere. This idea, it, it can't be completely uh, comedy because it needs to be a little bit like, uh, not, not spooky, but like interesting. And if it's just funny, then it's like, it's a quick joke and see you later, bye. But they're doing this whole, was it Bal Baluminati? Yeah, Baluminati. It's catchy. And they're playing on this idea that it's kind of like, isn't it like a late night thing? Isn't it like, oh, yeah, yeah, the whole, the men after men. night, and it gets dark and that's when the Baluminati come out. It's like, uh, it's, it's kind of catchy. And I think it's just a okay. good job of branding. Okay, 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 okay. The high guy, hear you. I piss, think piss all over it. No, let, no because because there's two places I want to go with this because we can't kind of trace all these conspiracies, and they're, they're not worth uh, tracking them all down, even the ones that I think are true. But let me hit you with a couple of things, and, and this is a long way around the barn to get to the conspiratorial stuff that interests me, which is primarily science and consciousness. As I was explaining to you as we were chatting a little bit about sure. before, you know, who are you? Why are you here? And science tells you you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe. That yeah. is a conspiracy, but we won't just deconstruct that now. I'll give you a really just kind of plain example, in your face example that is just impossible to ignore. New York Times. Okay, so this is from December of last year. This is like two months ago, right? D did you hear this? Did you process this, Bo? No. You uh, see, <laughs> I mean, okay, well, just watch the video. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna play the video. Dude, there's a fucking going on, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. So, what you have here is the New York Times saying that UFOs are real, saying that Harry Reid, Congressman Harry Reid, ran a project, a secret project, and they were investigating UFOs and they found them to be real. I mean, what, what, what? disclosure, uh, controlled disclosure, 
but they're in your face telling you UFOs are real. So, you know, it's cool that, I guess it's cool <laughs> that you haven't heard about this, but what are you going to do with that? It, it, what, okay, is so, your mind okay. blown? So, so, no, my mind is not blown. Uh, it's a <laughs> UFO, an unidentified flying object. No. That could be some, anything that's unidentified. It could be some project of something, right? That the, gov what? the government has plenty of things going on that you have no idea about. So, is but that hold on, hold on, Bill. Yeah. I mean, see, this is the problem that I said before. Like, if you haven't investigated at least a little bit, right. then the conversation gets kind of. It, 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 stupid. It, it gets stupid. <laughs> it gets stupid because yeah. what they're investigating is not, gee, what's up there in the air? What they're investigating is UFOs. UFOs in the sense of the word, you know, I just did an interview with uh, Colonel John Alexander, who is this guy who's been in the military for 40, 50 years. All the MK Ultra stuff is all associated with all that kind of stuff in, in a real way. I mean, that's his history. You know, he worked mm -hmm. on the Stargate program, psychic spying. He is a colonel, retired colonel. He just wrote a book about extended consciousness and drinking ayahuasca and, oh, yeah. and all that stuff. But he has long been known to maintain this position that the government isn't hiding anything about UFOs. They just don't know about UFOs. Well, the main point, one of the main points I had with John is you can no longer maintain that position. Everyone who's in the UFO community has known that the government is hiding this up for 50 years, and now it's in your face in the New York Times. So it's not like you can put the genie back in the bottle and say, as Neil deGrasse Tyson said, is exactly what you did, well, they are unidentified. That's laughable. You have our best fighter jet pilots in our most highest technology going, Bro, what the fuck is going on? These things are maneuvering. They're not just objects. They're maneuvering. They're not us. We don't know how to do any of this stuff. We don't know how to move at 6,000 miles an hour and make right turns. But if, if you accept it all that this is real, that it appeared in the New York Times, and it did, and you can go read all about the disclosure of it and stuff like that, then you have to accept that since 1955 that we have released documents from the government that said, we know these things are real, we know these things are happening, we don't know what to do with it, it's our highest level security item. So I, I, I'm gonna sound kind of like a jerkish here, but if you don't know that stuff, you don't know that stuff, but you can't just fill it in with the gap of saying unidentified means unidentified. That's just, that's not responsive to the data that's at hand. It doesn't really deal with the data. Right. And we're open to having aliens on the podcast. I mean, we'd really love to have, <laughs> as, I, I'm actually seeking, I, I like have already had conversations in my mind with, uh, when I do encounter someone from another kind, what I would say to them. And I'm not quite sure if I think aliens are like a dark force trying to kind of pull us in and do some demonic stuff on us, or if they're trying to help us and raise us up and have stuff to help the human race or somewhere in between. So I'm not I, quite sure where I, I do I... like the idea that we make first contact and the, the, the thing they say right out of the gate is, hey, uh, can we get on that show, Campfire Shit Show? <laughs> can we, yeah, we really want to do the show. So if there are any ET beings listening, we would love to have you on Campfire Shit Show. The problem Call is, is it's so mm -hmm. hard Call to in. see. Beam in. It's so hard to know what's real and not real, even in the news. And I say that in the sense of, so much can be fabricated. I, I could make that video. I could make that video. Now, that's not saying that that video is not authentic. I'm just saying, like, somebody could make a video like that, right? No. You don't think so? You don't think well, that someone... That's some not the point. I mean, the point is not that someone could make that video. It's like, oh, oh, okay, Bo, go down that path. Who made the video and released it in the New York Times as being a video, a part of a $20 million U.S. secret program into sure. UFOs. Sure. Who went and talked to Harry Reid, who they went and interviewed and said, yeah, I ran the program, this and that. So go ahead, make that, tell, tell me how that all happens. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I hate when people replace one conspiracy with a bigger conspiracy. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Fair um, enough. Well, I mean, then in that case, like, the reality is I, I don't know. And I do believe that there's something bigger than than what I understand, for sure. And so... Uh, We're available to get, like, beamed up if someone wants to 
take us. This could be a shortened show. (laughs) (laughs) Because we're going to get beamed up? No, we could. But, uh, yeah, no, listen, I want to be open to the idea. I'm not, maybe it sounds like I'm being very close minded. I'm throwing the uh, response out there that's like, well, it is hard for me to believe some of these things, um, not because they can't be or could not exist, uh, but because I have not spent my time and I'm very much ignorant towards a lot of these subjects. Well, you don't have to go the ignorant route. We don't have to throw that out. Don't throw the I word out there. <laughs> but, uh, from my experience in, in doing this show and dealing with all sorts of different people, as I told you, you know, I mean, pissing off all the atheists, mm-hmm. which I did early on, pissing off all the Christians, which I did shortly thereafter, pissing off all religious people of any time. <laughs> What I found is consistently the problem is that we hold on to our belief systems. And we all do that, you know, because when you wake up two o'clock in the morning and you're wondering how life should even go on or what my role is or all the dark night of the soul moments that we have, even if we don't believe we have a soul, the only thing you have to hold on to are your belief, your structure of how the world works. And when somebody comes along and says, no, 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 no. That's not how the world works. We're not real comfortable with that. And and consistently we show that we're not. Like, you know, we all look at like Scientologists and people like that. And we go, gee, how do those people hold on to the beliefs? And then haven't they seen the TV shows? Haven't they seen this? And right. I, I always point out this sociologist who wrote this awesome book a, a long time ago. And it's called When Prophecy Fails. And what he wanted to do is he said, you know, what happens when a cult leader has a group, has a belief system, and is prophesizing about the end of the world, and the end of the world doesn't happen? I mean, that's a pretty definitive event. You know, yeah. the world's going to end on Friday. What right. do you say on Saturday? <laughs> and what you'd expect, you know, because we all think we're open-minded and rational and all that, you'd think everyone's going to be like, okay, <laughs> pack things up. You know, it's, it's closed down. And, and they don't. What they do, what he found, the sociologists who studied this, is they double down. They don't say, oh, okay, our leader is not all-knowing. They say, oh, he knows he just got the date wrong. They double down. Uh We'll do anything to protect our belief systems. So here, you know, it's unfair for you, Bo, but you just were exposed to the reality that the government has known about UFOs, from another planet, there's from another system, whether it's time travel or whether it's multidimensional, however the fuck you want to put it together, it ain't our birds up there flying around, it ain't a mistaken, unidentified thing, it's a superior superior technological thing that's up there. So your world is blown and that's just the reality, but you're going <laughs> to not face that. You're going to do everything you can to work around that. Oh, that's but, pretty, but that's I pretty be, hardcore. But I want to be clear. But I he's sweating. Be, I, his sweat is dripping. No, no, no but I want to be clear. It's not that I don't believe that that could exist or that does exist. I do believe there's something else out there. Absolutely. 100%. I just feel like at, in the same breath, uh, I look at things with a skeptical eye or, or I just look at things maybe with a maybe with a closed mind. I'm listening to you and like maybe I'm looking at this with a closed mind. Are we taking our clothes off now? Is it getting hot in here? What's going on? I was buttoning uh, up. No. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's exposing. It's more getting cold. Truth. It's getting yeah. cold, I guess. Uh, yeah. So I do believe. I mean, you show me a video of a UFO and it's like I can say, yeah, I totally believe that 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 probably exists. But at the same time, I, I can go the other way and be like, but can anybody make this video? Like, uh, what, what what's to believe and what's not to believe, you know? Meryl, and I can, oh. Meryl, Meryl, jump in there. Rain, just reach over there and <laughs> knock him on that, that head. Well, I'm almost to the other extreme where I think some people in the uh, culture right now might be like even, an, I think they may be integrating another part of extraterrestrial people within like who we're seeing today. So I feel like some people are being made into like half aliens, half humans. I, I really do sound crazy, but I agree with that. So I almost think alien and extraterrestrial is like seeping in more than we know. And it probably already has been. And I mean, I feel like the government really has come out and said, yes, there are UFOs. And that has been leaked. There, like, there has to be. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But I mean, it may be even more integrated than we know currently. So I think like we may have, or the government may have more contact with extraterrestrials. Well, but before we totally blow Bo out of the water there, we just send him. I like, I like, I feel Launching like uh, suddenly I'm the science experiment. You guys brought me. I love this. that. Yes. We're, we're going to break this dude. We're gonna yeah, break we're going to break. Yeah, this is, this is an MK Ultra program. Oh, yeah. yeah. We are going we to break it down mind control. At the end, you will. He's going to be having like a butterfly on his, uh, on his eye and holding like in a bathtub. Alex, I would like to expose something. Okay. Okay. So. I would like to ask you your thoughts about yoga because we're here in Southern California. Yoga is very po uh, popular. I am like, I don't practice yoga anymore because I was doing a lot of Kundalini yoga a few years ago. And that's what ultimately I think led to my like psychic meltdown at the time. And I think yoga is like an opening to dark forces and not to completely change it, but I wanted to get your take on it. And if you've had people, I know you talk to a lot of people that are based in Eastern philosophy and Eastern practices, but to me, like I'm very skeptical about yoga and I think it should be practiced kind of with care and concern, not and it's very popular here, but I think yoga is kind of like a cult practice. I know. I've been practicing yoga for like 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can also have them make up for it. For some, like, I think for someone that's already kind of teetering off the edge like me, um, when I do yoga, it seems to open up like portals to things that aren't the best for me. So when I was doing a lot of kundalini yoga, I genuinely think I got some type of like weird spiritual like meltdown thing happening and I was having hallucinations and I was like feeling weird things and almost like kind of hearing voices and it was not good for me. And then when I stopped, it took me a while, but everything kind of settled down. Well, you know, the thing that I think is kind of an important part of this whole process in, in a broader sense is, and, and I think that's what Skeptico has kind of been about, you know, Skeptico, the origin of it is kind of be skeptical. And it took me a long time to figure out the, the, the true meaning of it. And that is inquiry, that perpetuates doubt. So I, I am in some ways more sympathetic to Bo. I think we should always be doubting. I think that's the only place to be. I think that's the true spiritual path is to always be doubting. Don't be accepting. Always take in our experience, but compare it to other experience and see what that means. As it relates to yoga, what I think a lot of folks don't fully appreciate is, man, you got people who've been studying that stuff for 2000 years. And, you know, I was like, do you know who Ram Das is? Yes. So Ram Das is a really cool guy. If you go back and look at the history, you know, Ram Das is this professor, Richard Alpert, at Harvard. And he's there with another guy you might have heard of, Tim Leary. Mm -hmm. And they discovered this crazy shit that the government brought in and said, hey, see what this might do for our MK Ultra Mind Control Program, and it's LSD. And he says, you know, how is this going to work? What could we do with it? Let's start doing some experiments. And they do. And the next thing you know, they're like, woo! <laughs> so we, we all know what Timothy Leary does, and that causes a cultural revolution, a cultural change. But Ram, uh, Richard Albert, who becomes Ram Das, he goes to India, and he says, you know, what is the what is the deeper meaning of this? And does anyone else know about this stuff? And he finds this guy up in the Himalayas, Neem Karoli Baba, and he gives him the LSD. And he says, here. And Neem Karoli Baba takes a bunch of it and says, there, it doesn't do anything to me. And it didn't do anything to him. And he said, okay, look, I'll tell you the truth. If you've really developed your yoga, I'm making this kind of a caricature of the story, but then you control your mind it's just a mind game. But it is an interesting medicine. It helps you see God, da, 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 da. Ram Das is totally blown away. Oh, my God, this, this, is, this is real in a whole different sense than we've understood it. It's not just a pharmaceutical. It is some kind of doorway to this higher thing. Well, the point of all that for your situation, Meryl, or your experience, is that Ram Das goes on to say, you know, a real eye-opener for me was looking at this culture. They deal with kundalini awakenings, of the kind that you're talking about, all the time. Not all the time, but it, it, it's understood that people might have a spontaneous kundalini 
awakening, this transformative spiritual experience, and they're kind of crazy uh -huh. for six months. And everyone just goes, okay, you know, just kind of be gentle, you know. They're going through it, you know, that's it, it'll work out. They don't put them in an institution, they don't give them a bunch of drugs, they don't point fingers at them and say, oh my God. You know, is, is it? As a matter of fact, they say the opposite. They say, wow, that person has made another step, either voluntarily or involuntarily, <laughs> along their spiritual path. They've worked through a lot of that stuff that we from the West come at it and go, Oh, no, no, no. We figured it all out. We're all biologic robots in meaningless universe. So therefore, if anything happens, it has to have a chemical origin right. to it. And we can figure it out and we can medicate you for it and all the rest of this. So the point being that when you say uh, yoga, there's just a ton of cultural experience and human experience thousands of years at it that really has to be studied and understood mm. and nuanced and there's a lot of people that are going through a lot of the same things that you are and you can find support groups you can find people to talk to that have had those kind of experiences and it's it's a whole rich area to explore would be my thing that's not me i mean i'm kind of spiritually dense you know i mean yeah. I, know and I, I see it i can get slight glimpses of it, but nothing like what, what you experience. But I still see the value in it because I'm not a biological robot in a meaningless universe. I am the voice inside my head, which is the voice inside of all our heads. We all hear it. It's no joke. Is something more than just a chemo random firing of chemical reactions that will go all pitch black when they stop existing? So, uh -oh, shut up. <laughs> so I was going to say, that was my first kind of foray into another realm, and I am a silly person, but it was a terrifying experience, and I was in yoga classes probably next to people like you who could leave the class and, like, go get a smoothie afterwards and then go to Trader Joe's and be fine, and meanwhile, I was, like, really at a time I probably could have or should have felt like I was, like, institutionalized or something like that. I had to take off work. I missed work for a couple of weeks. You know, I really had a big, giant, psychic experience that kind of scared me into being fearful of the realm but now I'm in the way where I'm like free will trumps all instead of be feeling like I'm at the mercy of having any sort of like evil spirits or anything like that I just have backed off on the yoga and a lot of TM and stuff like that and just because I know for my own genetic makeup it might not be for me or I'm kind of just scared to go further into that route to be completely honest you know I uh had to like integrate myself by drinking alcohol and watching baseball games and like <laughs> bringing myself down a little bit. Cause I just don't think I'm like, I wasn't rooted enough to go up there at the time. And I don't, I still kind of think I'm not, but what went down the path of that is being really interested and open to the idea that there's a lot of other kind of forces at play because I, I experienced it myself of feeling like uh, stretched to the point of like losing grounding a little bit. And that's why I'm on Lexapro. No, just kidding. <laughs> I should be. Thanks to our sponsor, like Simpulso. <laughs> but no, that's not it. But it's good to talk about. And I think it's like, especially being out here in Southern California, there's a lot of spiritual work and energy work. And everyone's a crystal healer and everyone's into Reiki. And I think like I had the experience where I'm like, wow, if you do a lot of that and you're around people that aren't safe, it can be a really, really terrifying and lonely experience. But now... I make a joke out of it instead of being really afraid of it. But there was months on time where it kind of ruined me. Well, you know, there's, there's I, I, like, I can't speak directly and never would try to speak directly to kind of your experience, but I can speak to the show Skeptico and it, it, it's, I don't want to say common, but it is the same story that you're talking about is told over and over again in a bunch of kind of strange places. I mean, one is the kind of spontaneous spiritual transformative experience that you're talking about over and over again. You hear it the same way. You know, we were talking a little bit about near-death experience, mm -hmm. science, you know, which is something that I really latched onto. What is the science behind it? Are there any peer-reviewed papers that would lead us to believe that consciousness does survive death? And at this point, there's over 200, which, again, Bo doesn't know about because he doesn't read the New York Times. <laughs> but... Bo, Bo doesn't know. That's our new campaign. Bo doesn't, know. Bo doesn't know. Bo doesn't know. 
No, what I was going to say is, you know, so you look at this near-death experience, right? And it's all about going to the light and light and love and all these unbelievably fantastic experiences. But then look at the other side of it, and some researchers have. It's the same kind of integration problems that you're talking about. People go through depression. People experience a much higher rate of divorce. People have this euphoric feeling of connection with everyone for a while, and then that dissipates and they can sometimes feel lost. Now, a lot of times it turns around and they actually build upon that and feel greater, but these recurring themes of dark night of the soul, um, the, the transformative experiences that kind of totally blow our reality and kind yeah. of knock us on our butt. All those things are, are, are just commonplace in this realm of spiritual transformation and just extended consciousness beyond this kind of dorky existence that we're told is all there is. That's really interesting. I feel like there should be a skeptical guide to having a spiritual breakdown <laughs> slash awakening. <laughs> I'd buy it. If you put it in like PDF form, I'd get she it. She would buy anything though, honestly. <laughs> she would buy anything. So yeah, I think now when I see, I'm, my mind is open to anything. So when I watch a lot of like to bring it back to music, which I'm very versed in, Bo and I are both versed in, a lot of the bands, uh, like when I watch their videos, I see the same symbolism of in a bird cage, in a bathtub, like butterflies all over. And I wanted to just kind of get your take on that in terms of now when, when you watch something, are you watching with the, the eye about what's going on or do you watch a lot of stuff just for enjoyment? Like, um, you know, I, I think I'd take that in like a different direction. And again, to try and re-engage with Bo because he does seem kind of put off. Of I'm not no, he's off. not. No, he I'm actually it. not put off at all. No, no you are so it. cool. I could tell you're more spiritual and... Meryl and I combined. I oh, yeah. You are. You're just, I don't know you're, about just, that, but. you're just so mellow and eat yourself. But, but when we were sitting on the couch, you were talking about, and you didn't even finish the sentence, but you were talking about experience. Mm -hmm. And I think where you were going was experience trumps everything. Yes. You know, and, and that's where I think I would go with with your point, Meryl. But before I can go there, I got to hear what Bo has to say. So uh, how, how do you feel like how do you process your experience in, in terms of your experience trumps everything? Well, I guess I, I guess I kind of mean like, like hearing a situation like today, knowing that I'm coming into a, a conversation with two people who are almost already connected in many ways, uh, belief system. And so, uh, I, knowing that I know I'm coming in from the outside, but I feel like the experience of that, I will learn something. I'm never going in go, I'm going to go make these people sound like they're crazy or I want to disagree with them in every way. If I do disagree, I will. Uh, I just feel like honesty over kindness, always say what you uh, is actually on your mind and accept new experiences in, in every way. Uh, I don't agree or subscribe to any one belief system. Um, I was raised Christian, but as a young man said, this is bullshit and got out of it. And so ever since then, I've never looked back. I've just kind of like, take what you feel is important or what you find uh, interesting from all these different parts. And experience has been the one thing throughout my entire life where I thrust myself into things that I'm uh, uneducated on, uh, uncomfortable with, just because I know I'm going to grow through that. And so that's what I kind of meant about the experience of this today is like, I know this guy is going to... Uh, hand my ass to me so <laughs> I should really go in there and uh, let him which is know? why we did a lot of LSD uh, the part, the part for the last six yeah. months so the you're like totally months. purple right yeah. now and... yeah. microdosing in the in the driveway <laughs> I saw we, it we had it with our Starbucks uh, chicken <laughs> biscuit <laughs> you know I think that's that's cool I, I speak to the other part because this is like kind of a pet peeve of mine is mm -hmm. you know trusting your experience do you trust your experience and to what extent are there limits to how far you would trust your experience and maybe just that? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I, gosh, that's a, such an interesting question because uh, of course I trust my experience. Um, I try to believe what I see. It, it, you know, I don't even know if I'm, I totally understand exactly what you're asking me because it seems like the answer is of course just yes. Do you trust your experience? Well, yeah, maybe I was being a little bit kind of obtuse there. 
You know, one of the things that happens when people have unusual experiences, like Merrill was talking about, mm. they're forced with this dilemma of, do I, how much do I trust my experience? How much do I trust an experience that shatters my reality? And I think on the edge of that, to me, is really kind of a interesting place to be, an interesting place that we all are. Like one of the, the kind of driving forces of this show has been, you know, trust your experience, but don't trust it too far. I mean, that is the beauty of science. What science says, you know, science at its extreme, at the ridiculous dopey level that it usually is portrayed, says don't trust anything about your experience because you don't have an experience. Your experience is an illusion. Your experience is the... Ra now think about that, see? It is the random firing of the neurons in your brain. You have no free will. There is no way around that. You're kind of curling up your eyebrows here, but... No, this no, is what I'm science, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't need to pick on you. I'm just saying it, it's so hard. My wife is a PhD in psychology and I say this and she gets mad at me too. No, it's not. <laughs> and she goes back and she goes back and reads and she goes, well, yeah, I can see how you can interpret that. There's really no other way to interpret it. That's what science is saying. There is no free will. There is no uh, ghost inside the machine, as they say it. There is nothing really sitting back there deciding what to think and what to do and what to observe. It's all a biological robot. This is an insane idea, but it's where science is stuck because it has some certain advantages in terms of making things work out. You know, part of the good part of not trusting your experience is, does Meryl take her entire experience and say, that's it, I heard these voices, they sounded demonic, therefore, you know, I gotta go with that. Or does she say, well, gee, you know, what other experiences are other people having? Right. How do I compare, contrast, fit in? Are there any science studies that have been done? Does this ever happen to anyone else? And so this process of both trusting the experience and at the same time not trusting the experience is kind of something that I play off on. And I guess I was picking on you again. No, really? Yes. Yeah, really. Alex, because I, I think I, you got a thing. You got a thing with me, I guess. Because <laughs> I, I, I think with that, with that, what, 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 do you trust your experiences? Well, now I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're open to... to... Um, first off, I, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you guys and I'm, and I'm like, yeah, I, I sound like an idiot uh, just because I sound like I'm so close-minded to new experience or, or new ideas or like I already have it set and I know what it is and this is life and blah, blah, blah. But I don't feel that way, honestly. I am feeling like a, a constant evolution of, of new ideas. And, and as you sit here and talk, I'm like, well, yeah, of course. Like, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on, on a lot of what you're saying. Um, it's just I'm still probably – getting over some of my own belief shit that uh, I haven't dealt with. And especially going back to UFOs and things like that, so I, I mean, like, well, I believe in them, but I don't believe you, you know, and it's the kind of thing. It's like, what am I arguing about? Like, truly. And, uh, and so I do think, do I do a lot of, I do a lot of thinking by myself and he's by himself a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hang out with me. Um, <laughs> No, but and in that time, I, I'm not a – I personally don't feel like I just go throughout my day not challenging ideas. I try to be an open-minded person. And that's not me saying, like, look at me, I'm open-minded. But uh, maybe that's for someone else to even say about me. Um, but I do feel like what you're saying right now is kind of messing with me a bit. So, um, yeah, the, the, the idea that I have no free will – I don't believe, and I kind of do believe. So I'm conflicted. I am conflicted. Because I can't explain why. Why anything is happening. I can't truly explain, other than I think, oh, I, I have the choice to do this, but like, yeah. So I think I am at a point right now where I'm on the edge of, uh, of, of learning that next place. Whether it's levels or something, I don't know. Um, 
So I'm open to your ideas, mm -hmm. even though they sound fucked to me. <laughs> uh, and I'm I'm willing to sit here through your ridicule, you fucks. And uh, let's let's keep going. Let's See, keep going. And what how I think is maybe some of like his uh, feelings are due to if we had like Mountain Dew yesterday, the chemicals in that, and then he ate a pig, and the pig was screaming for its death as it. Like, it didn't want to die, and then now he has, like, the pig's cortisol in him. So I, I think that there's a lot at play. I also happen to be, like, a, I love animals. I love animal welfare. So I always think about uh, where people come from, but I also think that there's a lot of, like, uh, I don't think I trust my experience in the way that the way that our food is contaminated now and the way that our air is contaminated. And, like, I trust my experience as, like, a soul person from the beginning, but now I feel like there's so much just messed up about what's going on in our like lifetime that I feel like I'm way off from the experience that like, I feel like the me that was born, like what I thought it was going to be when I came into this planet. Now it seems like way messed up to me. Like I almost feel like I didn't ask for all this on a certain level, <laughs> like to be on this at a time when like things are so kind of contaminated, whether it's food or air or just beliefs or fear, jealousy, you know, like, I don't know. I almost feel like I'm too sensitive to be on the planet at this moment. <laughs> I don't think you're, you're, you seem to be doing okay on the planet. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see. The planet loves you. The planet accepts you. Thank you. I do love that planet too, but that's a lot. That <laughs> I like I how he's speaking for the planet. But yeah. Like, that, that was a planet that just called. And like, 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 it's like, it's his cousin. He's like, no, no, no. No, Gary the likes planet, you. Everybody likes the you. The planet the, loves you. The planet's coming over Sunday at one. So we'll buy uh. some chicken thighs. But yeah, that, that's the thing I think about, too, is uh, just the hypocrisy, and I'm completely hypocritical, too, of, like, having beliefs, thinking that there's stuff out there, but to me, like, consuming beings or, you know, animals that didn't want to die is a big thing I think about. I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but it's something that, like... Wait a minute. I know. <laughs> you would... Marilyn, no, wait, wait, I was with you right yeah. up until that one. And it's something, too, that it's a big, giant, like... Uh, disparity in how I feel and think and sometimes we'll be even on the way here we ate a chicken sandwich and in my well, mind why did you eat the chicken sandwich you didn't have to eat the chicken sandwich. I don't know I'm in a weird zone where like I haven't no oh, you just ate the chicken sandwich you're not in any weird zone you just decided to eat the chicken sandwich but uh, now, now yeah, I have Meryl. the chicken's soul a little part of the chicken's soul in me that was a Starbucks sandwich it wasn't even real chicken probably honestly it was like it was it was probably like Haitian kids from yeah. the we yeah, ate at Taco Irish Bell, Irish. actually. We, we could not get enough of the Balluminati, so. Balluminati. <laughs> what if I go through the drive-thru and ask for, like, I'm just like, can we get the, the triangle meal? But, yeah, so th that's a big thing I think about, too. And I think ever since I had my experience, I'm way more open to, like, like, I think about the way cows feel at, and their fear as they, like, walk to get killed and everything. And that makes me want to, like, fall to the floor and crumple. But I still don't choose to eat vegetarian or vegan, which I – and I, so, like, on a certain level, everything that I – feel is like bullshit too i can't be uh holier than that with any of my beliefs because i feel like i'm one big walking hypocrite it's in in that realm particularly well, this, maybe, maybe. this is why i'm so skeptical of everything she says are you vegetarian or vegan no no, no. but i i am you know my personal philosophy is you know i'm about 90 percent vegetarian oh that's I great eat very yeah. little and 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 i think in my way of thinking that's good I mean, that's a move in the right direction. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Less meat is good. It's it's good in kind of all these different environmental ways. It's probably also good for your soul in the way that you're talking about. But I don't get too hung up on it, you know, in terms of that part of it, because you can't, in, in, in my understanding, you can't really follow that through to any logical conclusion in terms of what that means in terms of all these different souls and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I I'm not at a level where I could pretend to kind of understand that. And I think that's also where some of this stuff takes you back to maybe kind of where Bo was at. I mean, if you really kind of process this, you realize that there are no answers because it is at a different level, you know. Yeah, that, uh, that's a little bit abstract. If science is wrong about the biological robot meaningless universe, then what they're really wrong about is this idea of consciousness. And consciousness is that voice inside your head, not the crazy voice inside your head, but the <laughs> calm voice inside your head when you just sit back and say, okay, I'm gonna say hello, 
And who heard that hello? Well, there's someone always something, some part of me that is always present. So that's a real consciousness. And that's the consciousness that does seem to survive bodily death. So these near-death experiences, these people have cardiac arrest, they're dead, their brain is no longer functioning, and yet they come back and can tell you how they were resuscitated, you know? Mm. I just had on a, a researcher, Dr. Penny Sartori, who that was her research, is to go and talk to people who had a cardiac arrest, were dead for a couple minutes, and then she says, how were you resuscitated? And most people are like, what do you mean? I was dead. I don't know how I was wow. resuscitated. But some people, and then, they, and then she goes, okay, well, well, just tell me what you think. And I go, well, they probably came in this and that. Well, they did it all wrong. Hmm. And then there's another group of people. These people have these near-death experiences, and they come in and they go, I was kind of surprised because there wasn't the paddles. They just came over and started pumping my heart. As a matter of fact, this one nurse couldn't do it very well, so she called this other guy over, and then they started doing it. There is no way that people should be able to recall after a minute or two after they're dead, how they were resuscitated. So clearly, not clearly, but apparently, consciousness survives bodily death. So the, the point then about consciousness is, if there really is this consciousness, if it really does exist, then it is probably fundamental. It is probably what everything is built on top of. So you, me, the microphone, all that is probably in some way we can't understand or articulate part of consciousness, just like we're part of consciousness, rather than we're here and everything is out there. Right. That's really abstract philosophical stuff. But if you process it, it's the only conclusion that makes any kind of sense if consciousness is real. And that's why science lies so much about consciousness and says, no, 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 let's just call it biological or what's meaningless universe. It's a lot simpler than getting into all that other stuff of how many angels hit on, fit on the head of a pin. Let's not go there. <laughs> I hope I come back as a snail. Or I feel like my consciousness will like get imported and I'm just going to be a snail like slithering across the pavement that someone steps on or something. But I was going to say, I actually grew up, my dad is a scientist and he's a botanist. Uh, so I grew up with a big science background, which I think helps in some way, like, you know, the way we classify kingdoms and the way we have Latin name for plants. And I like that view of science where it helps us classify the tangible things in life. But uh, I definitely have the wide open view of, other things happening in the realm. But like, I love science in a way where now if someone's leg is bleeding, science has helped us develop it. Like, I don't think it would do much good just to be like, my leg is bleeding, but the consciousness of the blood is the same as the, as the like stretcher that I'm laying on or something like that. You know, I love the way that uh, we've developed antibiotics and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know. I think both I'm respectful of science but I'm also uh, open to other realms within consciousness. <laughs> hey, so you guys tell me, where are you going with Campfire Shit Show? <laughs> now, that you've, now that you've been blown away by the UFO reality, well, now I'm it's fucked. probably going to change no, the whole I'm direction. No, I'm totally screwed. I don't even want to do the shit show. I'm actually going to come on your show from now on, even though your viewers are going to hate it. Um, I'm going to come and just be here every week. And I'm planning an intergalactic tour for us. <laughs> so, uh, Elon Musk, if you're listening, we're ready to... <laughs> uh, no, uh, we have a mix. We This is why we love talking to you. We love talking to anyone with strong beliefs, whether they're comedians, uh, you know, people like you, any... Uh, what you're saying is you're not funny at all. <laughs> you're very um, funny. Comedians or people like you. <laughs> um, yeah, I know actors, we have... We have all types of really interesting guests. And, and a lot of it is about like getting down to uh, not what we do, but who we are. And, and, you know, a lot of people want to talk about the job that they have or the, you know, maybe even the belief system that they have. But we want to talk about the the joining forces of what, what a story or an experience can bring people. And a lot of times that comes out very cleanly uh, in front of a campfire. You know, as a kid sitting around a campfire, people start telling stories and it's just nice to hear that we all are kind of in the same place, regardless of our beliefs. And we've all had that embarrassing story or that thing that has shaped us in some way. Um, 
over and over and over again. And so we try to get to that and, and, and in a comedic way, in a fun and comfortable way. Yeah. And I think it's all just like a cosmic joke anyway. So yeah. good and bad. And we just look at it from a like a cosmic what are, what are some of your favorite shows so far that we've done? Yeah. Oh, uh, we just had a comedian on who is uh, a fantastic impressionist. So I loved hearing about her realm. She had a, a hit go viral. Her name is Lauren O'Brien. And a few years ago, she had a viral video on YouTube that got up to like 16 million views. It was talked about on Good Morning America. She had the Ellen Show calling. So I really enjoyed that episode because she talked about what it was like to go kind of internet famous within a night. You know, she was on a flight from here to New York. And by the time she landed in New York, she was famous on the internet. And uh, it was really weird to hear her view of how she kind of made it in Hollywood would for a few weeks and then before you know it the news cycle was over and she was dropped her agency dropped her and just how she recovered from then so i feel like people that are interested in the entertainment industry will really love it because it's an inside look at how exciting it can be and everyone's kissing your ass and then all of a sudden you're dropped like a cold potato and uh no one wants you so i i like that episode a lot yeah and juxtapose that with the last episode which was uh i was curious that maybe my <laughs> girlfriend was uh, oh, cheating yes. on me and so uh the universe happened and put me in a situation where i actually got to catch her cheating on me with a guy and it was just i just lay the whole story out and it's very vulnerable and awful and wonderful and i feel electric because of it but it wasn't a great thing to go through that was the latest episode of course bo is trying to tell me as a friend and i'm like wait wait we have to podcast about this i know your heart is broken but this is really good podcast material so he to he told me this story genuinely for the first time that's i mean i don't know i mean it's it's horrible to go through that but what do you make of that that part of podcasting i think that's absolutely awesome I think that's awesome that you did that and you shared that. And I'm sure a lot of people, you know, benefited from it. And at the same time, I relate to the exhilaration part. You know, it is exhilarating to share and be that open in that way. Do you yeah. guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I've made, I think we've both made a pact with each other and the podcast to be as real and honest as we can and to not put on any airs. So I love that beauty of podcasting just because we're not beholden to any sponsors the way that radio is. Um, and yeah, I'm hearing a lot of feedback. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, oh, I'm sorry. I was getting too close. Oh, that's okay. Okay, now I can hear. So yeah, let me start over. I was just going to say I love the beauty of podcasting because we're not beholden to sponsors the way that radio is. And so we can come with our own opinions. And uh, if the listener doesn't agree, they can keep listening or they can switch off. But you know, our sake of the podcast, no matter how big the listenership is or if it gets smaller or bigger, it's like we're going to stay true and in integral yeah. to ourselves uh, the way that you have with yours. I'm doing nobody a favor by making up a story. I'd rather just be completely honest. So. But shit, man, that's. Do you realize that there's never been anything like that that we know of in history? I mean, that is kind of mind blowing. But think about it, Bo, even five, ten years ago, there was no one broadcasting to everybody mm -hmm. their catching Dirty. their girlfriend yeah. cheating on them. I mean, what do you think that what do you think that what do you think about that? What do you think that means for our culture? I think it's a, it could be a great thing. But as we were talking about with the neighbors thing, you know, mm -hmm. you're not telling it to your neighbor. Yeah. But you're gonna tell it to the world. I mean, that's maybe true. That's good. Yeah. true. Maybe that's really cool. No, I, I think we have that uh, we have that place to do it now where we didn't have it. And it is safe for me to tell a story to Merrill in front of two microphones and not sit in front of a huge crowd of people and go, uh, I have to challenge the fact that my girlfriend cheated on me. And then I have to ask the question, why? I mean, ultimately, I come to the decision that if someone's going to cheat on somebody, it, it's not your fault. It's their fault. It's on them. They get to live with that junk. But... It, it is very vulnerable, and, and I think in many ways it's therapy. It's absolutely therapy. Instead of holding things in and letting it destroy you and letting it grow bigger than you, uh, put it out there. Say, fuck it. I'm going to expose this th for what it is. Exactly what you're doing. You, you're kind of putting some exposure out there. Putting your honest-to-God feelings or honest-to-goodness feelings um, <laughs> and out there, honestly, honest and, and letting people, you know, that's why you have viewers or, or listeners because they go, yeah, 
I feel that way too. And I've had people already write me and say, man, I'm so glad you shared that story. You know, hardly ever do people get caught. They just get away with it and you find out later or something. But like I was in the trenches like, I see you. I'm going to get you, you know. And so uh, they really enjoyed that. And so that, that tells you a lot about what society really wants. They are craving for that like honesty or that vulnerability. You know, and I guess part of the place I was going with that is that I think the knee jerk reaction, especially from people from the outside looking in, it is to kind of uh, disparage that or kind of say, you know, oh, how screwed up, you know, our culture is that uh -huh, you won't uh -huh. share it with your neighbor, you won't go bowling. But you. And I feel like you do. I feel the opposite. I feel like, no, this is what we've all been craving mm -hmm. is a, a, a community of our own making a community that is voluntarily put together. It's not the Thanksgiving table that you're forced to sit around and right. forced to kind of play. You No, these are your people and you can talk to them about the stuff that you really care about and you can connect with them in a way that you never could before. <clears throat> I think it's absolutely fantastic in a number of levels and I'm sure it's therapeutic, but what happened with the girlfriend? <laughs> Well, she's a piece of shit. I mean, that's yeah, what I'm like her at all. <laughs> the end of the story is she's a piece of shit, and I'm if not going to talk like, to her. Yeah, again. I was not very excited. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm taking self defense just for when I run into her. <laughs> but I was going to say I'm very involved in podcasting in general. I work for a podcast company. Um, it really touches me when people, for the first time, take to the mic, and even if they don't know quite how to express themselves, I really love that we live in a time where. Yes, yeah, some of it done is done in like the I or the me or the ego, but I think a lot of times it's done just to like have a way to express ourselves and we've kind of, we don't need traditional radio or traditional television channels anymore. We can blaze our own path. And I think for people like you, like us, who are just naturally want to create content, uh, I love that there's really no boundaries anymore. You know, we have friends that pretty much make like full length movies with their iPhones they're putting out content and you don't have to wait for anyone. You can do it on a on a smaller budget or no budget at all. So I love that it's taken away the like, oh, I want to express myself, but I can't because X, Y, and Z. Or it, we just have kind of reached past that. So like I'm not of the mindset. I know a lot of people think, oh, everyone has a podcast. Everyone has a YouTube channel. But to me, it's like awesome if human beings are expressing themselves. They're happier. They're more at peace. And uh, good luck to everyone. I think, you know, I think that's. That's yeah. how I feel. Right on to that. Well, this has been awesome. It really has, and it's so fun. It is so fun. Will you come on our podcast? Oh, of course. Oh, my will? God. Okay. Oh, yes. Revenge is mine. Uh, no, I, I, no, I, no I, I, I would love to have you on. Okay, and I will be humble. I'll be quiet, and I'll take my beating as I deserve it. Good. I'll do some kundalini yoga before, so I'll be, like, shaking and tremoring and stuff for you. So. And I'll have a, I'll have a uh, party tray filled with Illuminati tacos uh -huh. and uh, taquitos. <laughs> Good. I'll feel the cow's pain dying before I eat it. So we're going to have a link to the Campfire mm -hmm. Shit Show because you're mm -hmm. going to want to check it out. You're going to want to check out those two episodes. I'm going to run over, you know, because I listened to some of the previous ones, but I haven't listened to those two. So, hey. Put them right up there yes. to the top of the list. That the one, is so cool. If we titled it Stakeout and Pandemonium. So that's the, if you see the one that's titled Stakeout, know that that's Bo's Stakeout where he catches a cheater. <laughs> oh, God, that's so cool. So my guests again have been Meryl and Bo from Campfire Shit Show from right here in San Diego. They're doing a great show and they're doing a lot of other cool things. You can catch up, uh, check out some of their other videos on YouTube. Y'all, thank you so much for doing this. Let's go, if you got time, let's go grab some lunch. Yeah, I'm hungry, yep. Thanks again to Meryl and Bo for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I guess I'd have to tee up from this interview is, I keep pitching this idea that conspiracies are central to this consciousness exploration, deep spirituality thing that we're trying to get at with this show. And I want to know if you agree. I think what I laid out here is this idea that conspiracies are somehow the bridge between what we want out of science in terms of scientific method, in terms of some way of organizing and understanding and measuring experience, and the craziness that science has become and the absurdity of biological robots in a meaningless universe than a premise that's completely false and filled with conspiracy and that 
in some way, understanding conspiracies in general give us a leg up on sorting that all out. That's my position anyway, but I want to turn that into a question and see what you think. So let me hear from you, either right here on the comment section, wherever that may be that you're hearing this, or through the Skeptical Forum or drop me an email like so many of you have, which is so terrific. And I will try my best to respond to everything I hear. Number of interesting shows coming up, number of interesting projects coming up. Do stay with me. There's some fun stuff coming up on Skeptico. Until next time, take care and bye for now. So thanks for watching this video. And if it wasn't really a video, but just an audio stored as a video, I apologize. But there's more videos out there as well. But please check out the Skeptico website. You can see it here. We cover a lot of different stuff you might be interested in relating to controversial science and spirituality. A lot of shows up there, over 350 of them or so, all free, all available for download. So do check it out. <music>